Final Fantasy series stands as one of the most iconic and enduring franchises in video games. Since 1987, the series has captivated gamers worldwide with its rich storytelling, immersive worlds, and memorable characters. But one of the most fascinating aspects is the evolution of its main characters. From pixels to polygons, today we're going to be checking out the evolution of the main characters throughout the Final Fantasy series and also examine how they have grown and changed over time. Before we get to all that, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already, and leave a comment down below. Let me know if you agree with my choices here for highlighting character growth and development. Really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this video today. Let's get to it. Once upon a time in 1987, Final Fantasy, believe it or not, was a brand new game. Series director and creator Hironobu Sakaguchi stated that Final Fantasy was inspired by the genius of Yuji Horii's Dragon Quest games with a little bit of Zelda and a sprinkle of Dungeons and Dragons wizardry on top. Now we could definitely go into a bit of the history of the Dragon Quest stuff, but we'll save that for another video another time. Compared to now, the original Final Fantasy was a simple role-playing game with no lead character. Well, technically you are the character. This is a role-playing game in which you, the player, could name any one of the Warriors of Light after you, your dog, your grandma, your car, who cares? It's your adventure, and you can play any way you like. In true role-playing fashion, the game does not provide detailed backstories or personalities for these characters, but you can develop your own narrative and attachment to the party members based on the gameplay experiences, the equipment you have, or again, what you even name these characters. It might even be hard now to imagine with the busy lives that we live. Back in the late 80s, it was so much easier to shut off all the distractions and just sit in front of your Nintendo and totally immerse yourself in this adventure called Final Fantasy. No phones, no internet, maybe some homework that you never did, but that's it. Total immersion. You could choose between six character classes for the four heroes to embark on a quest to defeat the four elemental fiends and restore peace to the world. The narrative is relatively simple compared to later titles in the series, focusing more on exploration, combat, and dungeon crawling gameplay. Obviously, this was the first attempt at creating a game like this, so many would say that it's bare bones, but I say it's a really great foundational game for the rest of the series. Once we got to Final Fantasy II, we had predefined characters, maybe not so much with distinct personalities, but definitely a little bit of backstory and some motivations. The game's innovative character progression system and focus on interpersonal relationships allowed for a slightly deeper and more engaging character development, enhancing the overall storytelling and emotional impact of Final Fantasy II. Now this shift towards a more narrative-driven approach set a precedent for future titles in the series, emphasizing the importance of well-developed and relatable main characters in the Final Fantasy universe. This was a tonal shift for Final Fantasy, and sure, yeah, it gets a bad rap, but it did more for the series than a lot of people realize. Let's jump forward now to Final Fantasy IV, where in my opinion, we get the first really good main character with Cecil Harvey. Cecil begins the game as a loyal and dutiful knight serving under the King of Baron. However, he becomes disillusioned with the king's increasingly malevolent orders and thus embarks on a quest for redemption, seeking to atone for his past actions and find a path to righteousness. He shows great character development in this game with these few things specifically. Cecil's journey from a dark knight to a paladin symbolizes his personal growth and redemption. As a dark knight, Cecil serves the king unquestioningly and carries out his orders even if they harm innocent people. However, after realizing the consequences of his actions and the king's true intentions, Cecil renounces his dark power powers and strives to become a paladin, a warrior of light and justice, almost kind of paralleling the first game. Throughout the game, Cecil assumes the role of a leader and protector, guiding his allies and making difficult decisions to protect the world from the forces of darkness. His sense of responsibility and commitment to his friends and the greater good drives his actions and decisions throughout the game. Cecil also forms deep bonds and friendships with his allies, including Cain, Rosa, Rydia, and the others. His relationships with his comrades influence his character development. As he learns to trust, cooperate and rely on his friends to overcome challenges and confront the game's antagonists. So after four years separated from the original Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy IV, released in 1991, wasn't playing around with not only the main character, but the entire game itself. There's a reason why Final Fantasy IV is held in such high regard even now. Now after Final Fantasy IV, the next big leap, in my opinion, for main characters was Final Fantasy VI. Final Fantasy VI is a unique title compared to previous games in the series as it features a large ensemble cast with multiple playable characters, each having their own backstories, motivations, and character arcs. The narrative of Final Fantasy VI is not solely focused on one main character, but rather explores the interconnected stories and experiences of its diverse cast. It can be argued that there are actually two lead characters in this game if we break down the game into two parts, as people often do. The world of balance, in which Terra is the main focus, the central narrative 
narrative aligns with her character development. In the world of Ruin, where Celis is often considered the lead, as you start with her, and only her, on a quest to find your missing friends and save the world, of course. Interestingly enough, both of these halves are vastly different in how they play out, with the world of balance being more linear and story-heavy than the world of Ruin, which still has story, but it's, you know, a lot of it's missable if you aren't looking for it. The narrative of Final Fantasy VI explores the interconnected stories, relationships, and the experiences of its diverse cast of characters, contributing to the game's depth, emotional impact, and enduring legacy as one of the most beloved and critically acclaimed titles in the Final Fantasy series. At the point in which Final Fantasy VI was released, it was easily best in this series, featuring some of the best character development yet. However, some would argue that Final Fantasy VI would quickly be overshadowed by... Yes, that's right. Final Fantasy VII. In 1997, Final Fantasy VII took the world by storm, and with it, protagonist Cloud Strife quickly became the face of the series. Now, in an effort to stay on track here, I only want to focus on Cloud and not the other cast members of the game. If you want to hear me talk more about Final Fantasy VII, or JRPGs, or Final Fantasy, make sure to hit that subscribe button, because 96.7% of the people that watch my channel actually aren't subscribed. So if you can hit that like and subscribe button, it actually does make a huge difference for a smaller content creator like me. With the transition from pixel graphics to 3D, Cloud's design really stood out at the time, capturing the attention of players with his detailed character model featuring spiky blonde hair, his large buster sword, and soldier uniform. Now, it's not all flash and fashion. There is substance to Cloud. He's initially presented as a cold and detached mercenary. Cloud grapples with his identity, memories, and the weight of his past as the story unfolds. His journey from disillusioned mercenary to a compassionate leader showcases significant growth, maturity, and personal development. This kind of character in his transformation is obviously going to resonate with a lot of people, and you might even actually find it relatable. In my opinion, this is a masterclass in showcasing the series' commitment to main character development, also while doing really great emotional storytelling. As of 1997, this was the most complex main character yet. There was a really great job done with the story of Cloud, but also allowing the world he inhabits to be properly fleshed out, at least, you know, as best they could on the PlayStation 1. To fast forward a bit, Cloud is one of the few characters in the series that has also had the benefit of not only being in other games like Super Smash Bros. or Air Guys, you remember that one? But also being a part of spin-offs within his own universe with the remake series, Advent Children, etc. It's clear that he's the go-to main character for Square Enix, and you know what? I'm okay with that. Let's fast forward ahead a few years to 2001 with the release of Final Fantasy X. This was a landmark release in the series and the world of video games, showcasing the technological capabilities of the PlayStation 2 and also delivering a compelling and immersive storytelling experience that has resonated with players worldwide then and still does now. With its innovative gameplay mechanics, memorable characters, emotional narrative, and critical and commercial success, Final Fantasy X remains one of the most beloved and iconic titles in the series in the RPG genre, leaving a lasting legacy and enduring impact on the gaming industry. At the head of this game was Titus, or Titus, whatever you call him. He was characterized by his youthful energy, optimism, and enthusiasm, which stands in contrast to the more serious and somber world of Spira. His lively and spirited personality really make him relatable and almost an engaging lead character of the game, and I think that's why a lot of people like him. Throughout the game, Titus undergoes significant personal growth, evolving from a brash and impulsive athlete to a mature and compassionate individual. His journey of self-discovery and understanding and acceptance of his destiny, in my opinion, was really second to none. Now, the interesting thing about Titus Titus was his relationship with his father, Jack, who is also a central and poignant aspect of Titus's character development and the game's narrative. The complex and multifaceted relationship, which is characterized by the initial admiration, resentment, misunderstanding, and eventual reconciliation, contributes to the thematic richness not only of Titus as a character, but the entire narrative of the game, highlighting the complexities, challenges, and transformative power of family relationships, love, acceptance, and personal growth. There's a lot of describable words here, but finally, Final Fantasy X is a really great story, and I can only describe it with very positive and reaffirming words. And the thing that really sealed the deal for me as a series first was Titus' voice acting performed by James Arnold Taylor. In my opinion, he effectively conveys his emotions, personality, and growth throughout the game. The voice acting added a lot of depth authenticity, and charisma to Titus' character. There was something unique about being a kid at the time and experiencing the game not only through the eyes of Titus, but through the voice of Titus as well. There was something really special about being able to hear Titus. I can't really describe it, but it's one of the few reasons that I rate Final Fantasy X so highly and have such a emotional connection to this game. The last main character I want to highlight in this video is actually with the most recent entry in the Final Fantasy series. 
Final Fantasy 16. And not to discredit the characters that were in 11 through 15, I personally think the next big jump from Final Fantasy 10 with main characters is actually 16. Feel free to disagree, but this is just me. Now, obvious spoiler warning here for Final Fantasy 16, but Clive Rossfield takes the helm as the main character of Final Fantasy 16. He's the Archduke of Rosaria's eldest son and the dominant of the dark icon Ifrit. There's something that we see with Clive that we don't see with any other character, and it's a greater look at his life. The story of Clive is shown in three different stages of his life. Age 15, which is essentially like the start or the prologue of the game. Age 28, where Clive starts to find more of his purpose, and he finds his childhood friend Jill, whom he got separated from in the beginning of the game, and Sid, who ends up being a mentor, a series staple, of course, Sid the Elder, Sid the Wise. And then we have the present day Clive, where he's 33, taking what he's learned from that midsection of the game where he's 28, and here he's more of a complete character than he was previously, but of course continues to develop as the story progresses. Clive's character is defined by a few key things. He fights to protect his family and his kingdom, even if his kingdom has been taken away from him earlier in his life. Clive has his brother Joshua, whom he believes is dead throughout most of his life. His death never stops haunting Clive, and he has this incredible guilt earlier on in his journey. Clive is driven by revenge, wanting to find the person that killed his brother, but ironically, it was actually him. Clive has to deal with the events of his past and embrace who he is. We of course do find out that Joshua had lived later on in the story though. Clive is also emotional in the best way. He's not afraid to be human, even though he's got some extra baggage. He's not afraid to cry, to be passionate. He's what being a man is all about, protecting the ones you love, even if it's going to cost you your life and not thinking twice of it. Honestly, I would argue that Clive is easily the most grounded and real hero we've had in the series. I would also argue that Clive is probably the most powerful protagonist in Final Fantasy, being able to transform into Ifrit and can also take the power of defeated icons to use for his own benefit. Thankfully, he does so for good and not evil. Clive is a prime example for a hero who leads by example, as opposed to ones who lead by power alone. Clive isn't followed because he's a strong leader. He's followed because the people around him actually appreciate him and love him. And hot take here, but his love story with Jill is some of the best love interest stuff in the series. Final Fantasy 16 is the first time in regard to voice acting anyway, where the English cast helped to shape these characters and give them the personality that they have. Nowadays, voice acting has such a huge impact on the story and how a character is perceived. And the voice actor for Clive, Ben Starr, absolutely nailed it and elevated Clive to a level that will long be remembered. So it's clear that the characters in Final Fantasy have come a long way from 1987 to now, from the original customizable party members of Final Fantasy 1 to the complex and deeply personal journeys of characters like Cloud and Clive, the series has consistently pushed the boundaries of character development in video games. Characters have transitioned from simple archetypes to multifaceted individuals with intricate backstories, emotional depth, and personal growth. The evolution of the main character in Final Fantasy as a series stands as a testament to the series developers, creators, and writers' commitment to innovation, storytelling, and emotional engagement. And as the series continues to evolve and adapt to the changing gaming landscape, I personally really look forward to the iconic protagonists of the future that will continue to enrich the legacy, the impact of Final Fantasy as a whole. So thanks for watching today's video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already and hit the playlist here if you want to see some more of my weekly JRPG and Final Fantasy related content. See you next time.